Jen, I know that your twins, your boys, were only two months old when your husband Justin died after a five-year battle with cancer. It's been such a journey for you. Tell me a little bit about Justin. Um, he was such a sweetheart. We grew up together, so we were like childhood friends. Um, he was shy, but once you got to know him, like everyone wanted to be around him. He was diagnosed with cancer. When that happened, what was your reaction? Just complete shock, because he was 24, young, healthy, um, just never thought this could be me. He went into remission, I know, for eight months, and then the cancer came back. And realizing that this may be your last chance, you decided to start a family. The vibe of it kind of changed from like, okay, let's get Justin healthy and let's, so that he can be here. And at some point it kind of was like, let's get him to this birth. Um, and the whole time during my birth, he held my hand and I mean, Right, you have nurses, doctors, it's loud, my doctor's yelling at me like, okay, push, push, push. But all I could hear was his little, like very faint voice. He had a very like kind of raspy, it wasn't his normal voice because of his lungs and all this stuff. And he just, I could just hear like, you, you got it, Jen, like you can go. Like, and I just like honed in on that and it got me through and it, Everett came out and, Justin was able to hold him for a moment, which was amazing. Just hearing this story breaks my heart, just envisioning you, a brand new mom, a husband who is so fragile, who is, you probably know, isn't going to be around. It was a lot of big feelings in a short amount of time. Like, here he was, you know, like welcoming life and life leaving. I was trying to take care of newborns, but also, you know, make sure I have spend time with my husband who wasn't doing well. Kate, you come to this from a very different vantage point as the patient. Tell us your story about being diagnosed with colon cancer at age 35. I had just gotten my PhD. I had a great job. I had this fresh, gooey little baby that always smelled like applesauce and cookies and has these huge eyes. And I married my high school sweetheart and it felt, uh, the world felt good and safe and, and like full of possibility for like a second there. Um, but I was having these weird stomach pains and I, I have no cancer in my family, so I, I didn't really have like any apocalyptic thought that it would be anything worse than something they thought maybe like a glitchy gallbladder or something. I thought my life, I thought everything was fixable, you know? So uh, then it wasn't. I was in my office just going through some nerdy research and I got a phone call that said that I had uh, stage four cancer. I remember leaving my office and like my cute little dress I like to teach in. And it was like I was fully leaving a world behind, but it was like, it was like a world I really loved. So it was kind of like the end of, that was sort of like the end of a life. Do you constantly feel as if the sword of Damocles is over your head or have you been able to get to a point where you don't think about it. I mean, that's so hard. Yeah. I think it depends on if, when you talk to me. If it's 2 a.m., then I would say, sometimes I'm really scared and I don't think I'm gonna make it till 50. You know, but 50 already felt so great, so why am I complaining? Like, it's just a tick, tick, tick. And then 2 p.m., I would say, science is incredible. I can't believe I made it so far. I could, you know, become cryogenically frozen and live forever as like a beautiful vampire, you know, <laughs> so. Elua, you are here from a, another perspective. Tell us what you do and why. Mm. I'm a death doula. And a death doula is somebody who does all of the non-medical care and support for the dying person and the family through the process. About 10 years ago, I was working at Legal Aid 
as a lawyer, uh, terribly depressed, doing domestic violence and sexual assault work, wasn't really using up all the parts of my body and my soul that I knew were available. And I went on a medical leave of absence uh, because I felt that my disease had progressed to the point where it would eventually kill me. Your depression. As depression, yeah, which is a terminal disease, disease if right. left untreated. And so I went on a leave of absence at that point and went on a trip to Cuba where I met a young woman on a bus, a fellow traveler who had uterine cancer. I discovered a lot of things about her that her death was something that she was living so closely in relationship with, but it was a private relationship, it was a secret one that she couldn't talk to anybody else about. Because when she would, people in her life would say, you know, focus on the bright side, or you're gonna get better, or don't even think about that. She had a psychiatrist through her oncology program, but he was talking to her about living with disease. He wasn't talking to her about the possibility of dying. And so at that point, I got pretty clear I wanted to support people in preparing for their death. Jen, how did you deal with Justin's illness because I know it was really, really hard for you to be there for him in a way you ideally wanted to. Yeah, I grew up with really bad anxiety when Justin was diagnosed with cancer. My anxiety was here and then cancer came and it went through the roof, just crazy. Anything that my husband, Justin, would express, he knew that it would trigger me. So your anxiety almost paralyzed the two of you. You couldn't, he couldn't share what he was going through. Yeah. Because of your anxiety. Part of me does feel a little guilty and sad that I couldn't be there as a support. You know, things change for us after our loved one gets sick and eventually after they die. And it makes sense that we're in process as well. I think something that the more noble thing to do is to shut our feelings off and just support the person that we love. But they're aware that we're also having feelings, you know, and turning it off sometimes isn't necessarily fair. Um, and so being with them as best as possible, which it sounds like what you did, is encouraging um, to be able to be with our process while being with their process is the best that we can do. Kate, when you were diagnosed and when you were very sick, what was it like from your perspective in terms of the way people responded or comforted. Yeah, yeah, and I'm relating so much to the, like you, no one gets to be outside of this ecology of pain, so you're kind of trading love and comfort. And I mean, there was a lot of anger. Why is this happening to me, blah, blah. <laughs> Wasn't I sort of a good person? <laughs> Things you feel kind of embarrassed to say. I remember saying, my husband is, he's never smoked. He eats right, he's healthy, he's a nice person. Yeah, the senselessness of it. And I think I, I felt tremendous shame because I could see pain on everyone's face. I just thought like, I, I am the bad thing. I have happened to them. And, and I think that made me much less likely to be honest. So when I was scared, I didn't really want to tell them. I just felt like they're carrying the weight of all this love. It felt, I found honesty was one of the first casualties of being sick. I remember my husband saying when he was very sick, having cancer is the loneliest experience in the world. And it broke my heart because I think he must have been so alone in his fear and pain and sadness and everything you deal with. How do you help someone feel less alone? I think what's most important is that we show up and we acknowledge that it's a difficult conversation and we don't know what to say because often we don't, we're like fumbling in the dark. We don't have a vocabulary for death and dying and pain and loss and grief. But you show up and you show up with a lot of love and make yourself available. Uh, I think a, there's a common misconception that our job is to help people get better, or help people accept their death or come into recognition of the fact that they're dying or something of this sort. But my job is really to be with people where they are. And if where they are that day is, I'm amazing and everything's great, then that's where we're gonna be. But <laughs> cancer's lonely and I don't wanna be doing this and I'm frustrated and I'm sad and I'm angry and I'm losing everybody and I'm trying to be strong for everybody else and they're frustrated, that's where we are with them. It's interesting that Kate said honesty was the first casualty and I guess it's a real gift to allow people, to give people permission to be honest about how they're truly feeling and what a relief it would have been 
for you to say, Kate, this sucks. Also, the great irony is that like, I'm an expert in the history of optimism and the idea that you can always fix your life. But I do know that we have these really thick cultural scripts that make it almost impossible for us to say true things. Like, I am, I'm tired because this is exhausting. I'm scared because the unthinkable is, is at my door. There's a new sort of term in the nomenclature, toxic positivity. People think they're being helpful, but they're actually really just kind of preventing themselves from being sad. That used to drive me crazy when people talked about the importance of Jay having a positive attitude. Because yes, I think there is a mind-body connection. It's not going to hurt, but sometimes biology works against you. And all the positivity in the world isn't go going to change that. Well, and it's so American. I mean, it is one of the great American contributions to the world is uh, it's cheerful, can-do spirit. But, but what it does is it forces people into a very tight set of scripts about words, acceptable words, acceptable beliefs. And then it locks us out of the kind of honesty that you're describing. Death is not one of those words that we're allowed to say, particularly when somebody's ill. It's, uh, it's off the table. You know, it's like we can't even look at it as a possibility. We live in a culture that has an endless account of agency and we just need to try harder and, you know, and, 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 that says that everything is possible and yet we know it's not. So finding that place, and the words I always use are limited agency, like action inside of a much smaller frame where we can just say, not everything is possible, not nothing is possible. What is possible today? Are there words, honestly, I'm actually listen, looking for words to say to someone that will not rob them of every hope, but also acknowledge the possibility. That's a tricky place to be in because we also have to pay attention to how that person is feeling and where they are because sometimes feeding that hope is a form of existential gaslighting. If whoever it is that you're talking to has some idea that this disease is going to kill them and we are saying, but just hold on for a miracle and they know, they know that this disease is going to be it, we're not making space for them to be where they are which is my life is ending now, what can I do with the time that I have left? Who can I be? What do I want to experience? So we shift the conversation from just let's hold on hope for a cure and what can we hope for for tomorrow? Jen, did you ever talk to Justin about dying? No, no. I was the extreme of just hope. I was on that extreme side. It, he is going to live and there's no other option. And that's how we were literally up until the night before he passed away. Like I, even the morning when he woke up and he wasn't breathing and they were doing CPR, like I was like, he's still gonna, like I, he's still gonna be okay. Like I just could never give in. And it is one of my biggest regrets now and something I like struggle with now. I've, I've had, dreams a lot with him in my dreams and like I feel like in a weird way it's like been kind of therapeutic because in my dream I've been able to like ask him the things that I wasn't able to ask because if I could go back I would be like what do you want what are your dreams and goals for your boys like what do you want in life like what write letters to them like you know what would you say to me as um, a single mom raising them again you know like so like, I would go do anything to go back and ask those type of questions. How do you help people not have these deep regrets? We culturally begin to talk more about death and dying. We recognize that death isn't a failure, that nobody has failed because somebody died. Just the body has done what the body can do and the body's now done. Um, we allow people to be human and finite and messy, we give them space.